So welcome and good afternoon, everyone. My name is Coralie Bouillot. I'm a patient representative for Chagrin disease within ERN Reconnect. And I'm, I'm particularly happy to welcome you all for this new webinar dedicated to Chagrin disease, especially because April is Chagrin Awareness Month, which is really important for us patients to raise uh, awareness and explore subjects about this uh, disease. So I will be moderating this webinar with, with Professor Pasco Romao, rheumatologist at University Hospital Center in Lisbon, where he coordinates the chagrin consultation. He is also disease coordinator for chagrin at ERN Reconnect. So Vasco will introduce uh, today's speaker, Professor Ayan Bissing, whom I thank for being with us today and for bringing his expertise on one of the main burdens of uh, Chagrin disease. So Vasco. Yes. Thank you, Coralie, for the nice uh, introduction. Uh, can you uh, change slide? Um. I don't have any, the other one okay. is the information one, yeah. Okay, the other one's missing. No, 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 no worries. Um, so yeah, so I will introduce our speaker, who is Professor Arjan Vissink, um, DMD, MD, PhD, who is working at University Medical Center Groningen, in Groningen, which is a reference center for Sjogren uh, in the Netherlands. Uh, Professor Vissing has a broad background in dentistry, medicine, oral and maxillofacial surgery, oral medicine and radiobiology. With regard to Sjogren's disease, he's involved in many studies aiming at the diagnosis, management and treatment of the oral component of this disease. And uh, it is really a privilege to have him here. And uh, in this webinar, we will, uh, the, uh, Professor Vissing will address a very common problem of patients uh, with Sjogren's, uh, which is dry mouth or serostomia, where, which is the, the, the medical term, um, that can happen with or without a reduced salivary secretion. Um, and this reduced saliva flow causes, amongst other things, many problems with eating, swallowing, speech, there, and there's also an increased risk of developing uh, dental caries and oral infection. And so the role of the oral component in the diagnosis complaints and progression of, of Sjogren's disease uh, will be discussed today, as well as the possibilities of treatment and or management of the oral complaints. And so I thank you. Um, Kohali has some brief notes and then we pass on to Professor Visek. Yes, thank you, Vasco. So please note everyone that this uh, today's webinar will be recorded and published on the Ear and Reconnect website and on social media, especially YouTube channel. You can ask all your questions during the presentation uh, within the question and answers box or in, uh, in the chat. And all the questions will be addressed to the speaker after the, the presentation. So I think now we can get started. Thanks again, Professor Vising. The floor is yours if you want to share your screen. I'll do. Thank you. <laughs> I also thank you both of you for introducing me and, and to ask me to, to tell something about the oral component of Sjogren's disease. But first I would start something to tell about saliva. Well, there's a very important liquid and many of you lack it and they feel the, the complaints and the other things. So saliva has many functions and although not essential for the maintenance of life, it contributes, as you have experienced, to the efficient working and protection of the human body. Occasionally, there can be a lot of saliva. It can be in certain patients that's very exceptional. Often, occasionally it can be sticky, but the most of the time, there is, it is not there. You experience just the, really, the dryness of the mouth. And this really nicely reflects what a dry mouth is. How dry I am, how dry I am, nobody cares, nobody knows. 
because people who do, don't experience the dry mouth can't imagine how the patient feels with a dry mouth. So what is saliva? Saliva is a watery solution of salts and proteins. You have three pairs of major salivary glands, one for the ears, the gland, the product glands, one below the cheek, the submineral glands, and two just below the tongue, the sublingual glands. But besides, you have hundreds of minor slivery glands in the palate, in the, in the cheeks, in the tongue, in the lips, and they all produce their own, own saliva. But how much saliva do we have? As most of you have learned at school, at least I have learned at school, most of it was one and a half liter or more. It can be one and a half liter or more, but mostly just up to five to 600 mill uh, milliliters uh, per day. We are pretty dry because the sheep produce a little bit more saliva. It produces about 40 liters, but that's much less than a cow. The cow is really wet and they produce up to 150 liters per day. It would be nice that we could use some of the cows and to moisten our mouths. Mm -hmm. And when is it produced? Because not as every time all glands are active. During the eight hours you sleep, you produce only 10 mil of, um, 10 mil of saliva in, the, in those eight hours. There's no product saliva in it. It's just saliva from the subliminal glands, the sublingual glands, and the minor glands. So during the daytime, when sitting, when reading, and, and walking around, you produce also about 300 milliliters. There is some contribution of the product glands. There's mainly the subliminal glands. But when eating and chewing, so it's one to two hours a day that you are busy with these things, then you get much more a contribution of the product. With acid, it is about half to half. And when chewing, it's just a mescatory uh, influence, then you get more product than the submineral saliva. So when it's active, during the sleep and also during resting, it is mainly the submineral gland, the sublingual gland, and the minor glands. There's no contribution of the product or very minor. And during the stimulation, there's more a significant contribution of the product glands. And that's will, as shown later, may have some problems. And as you can see here, there's a function of saliva. And there are many of those functions. When there's a lack of saliva, you get problems with it. You get problems with your, with your, your food, the, the, how it digested. You, you taste only when there's saliva in your mouth because the food sh should be dissolved. When you have a really dry mouth and you give the peppermint in your mouth, they just feel it like a button. So they don't feel the, the peppermint. Just before, uh, when there's a sip of water, and you, you place then the peppermint on the tongue, then the, the peppermint flavor can be, uh, can be experienced. You have buffering, lubrication, remunization, inhibition, it's all the protection of the teeth. You have antibacterial, antifungal, and antiviral properties. And there are much more components in, but this is just some examples. And when it's a lack, you can also, uh, I, uh, so on, the, on the top, on the lower bottom, you see saliva gives you the ability to taste the food, what I told you. When it's a lack of saliva, mirrors may stick or tongue may stick to the pellet or other things. You can see here there's a, the carrier's pills in dry mouth. You can have a yeast infection or other infections, and you can even swallow uh, slivery glands. But when does a mouth feel dry? And that's just an example I uh, took from a 60 year old female. She felt dryness of the mouth, xerostomia. It's not hypersalivation, there's a reduced flow. And she used medication, salbutamol, that's in the corticosteroid inhalation, and paxitin is an anti antidepressive, so it's not a showing patient. And the surface of the mouth are wet after stimulation. 
So when you look in the mouth, oh, it's nicely wet. But often a dentist looks a little bit longer than a physician. But when they would have looked a bit longer, then the, the, the surface was dry again. So what was the problem in this case? This was collecting of whole saliva, unstimulated, citric acid stimulated, and chewing stimulated. And between brackets are the normal values. So there was no shortage of saliva. Then they looked at the physical elasticity of the saliva. There was about two millipascal and about 0.2. And actually, it was pretty much water because water, and normally the saliva is much more sticky. So the saliva of this patient resembled water. And is that a problem? And therefore, we did an experiment. There was, we put some lips, it was a blunt needle, and we put some droplets on the mucosa of the lip. And then you can measure the contact angle. When, like a car which is waxed, there's a very large contact angle of the droplets on the left. But when it's saliva, you get much better moistening of the old uh, mucosa, you get a much more spherical contact angle. Therefore, we tested water, saliva substitutes, and, uh, and saliva on the old mucosa. Here on the x-axis, you can see how long the droplet was on the, on, on, on the lip. The higher contact angle gets a worse moistening, and the better moistening were, was on the bottom. And of all things tested, water was the, best, the worst moistener of the, uh, the, the mucosa. Life was much better, and around were some substitutes. We've come back to metal cellulose. And when you have substitutes with, uh, with mucus in it that's on the bottom, that gives a much better moistening. So actually, water, you, can, you like, patients like to use water, but it drips off the mucosa. It doesn't stick to the mucosa. So a dry mouth does not equal that there's a lack of saliva. So the feeling of a dry mouth is serostomia, to less saliva is a hypersalivation. And serostomia and hypersalivation can be present at the same time, but as was also uh, told uh, in the introduction, it is not always the case. Mm -hmm. Of course, patients can complain about a dry mouth and have an abnormal secretion of unstimulated whole saliva. And that's what you expect. But patients can also complain of a dry mouth and have a pretty normal secretion of the unstimulated saliva, like in this case. But also in the opposite, patients with an abnormal low secretion of saliva do not complain about the sensation of all dryness. So that is that we have to figure out what is the problem in this patient. It is not an exception. So this discrepancy exists in about 20 to 30% of the patients. So what you can do, you can, the sensation of all dryness, you can do it with a questionnaire. It's a very nice question, the xerostomia inventory, but also the three questions which are usually uh, asked in the, in, in the practice gives a very good impression. Do you daily experience the old, the old dryness for more than three months? Do you need drinks to swallow your food? And when the patient doesn't tell it, when you it does tell, just ask what he is eating, because he's not eating a biscuit or not a, a cracker, because that he has to swallow with drinks. And do you have recurrent swelling of the slivic glands? And the hypersurfacing you can measure. You can do it in resting conditions. And then you can uh, collect it after stimulation. You can use some paraffin wax. And on the left side, is, is very uh, thin sheets you, you, uh, you can uh, buy for it. Or you can use acetic acid. And then you get a stimulated 
uh, saliva. When you really would, uh, would like to see in the patient, then you have, can collect the product glands and you can do submental and sublingual glands. That's not for the, the common practice, but we did it just to see how, uh, what, what gland is active at what time. Mm -hmm. And here, for the product, this is a double uh, chambered uh, cup. The outer uh, wing is that you can put uh, slightly under pressure so it sticks to your, your cheek. And then the saliva is collected in the central chamber and it flows here after stimulation. Uh, uh, you can collect it. And when you do it on both sides, at the same time, you can collect also with a blunt syringe the saliva which uh, is in the floor of the mouth. That's mainly the submental saliva with some contribution of the sublingual glands. And what you then could see, these are the healthy patients, the patients with one year complaints, with one to four years complaints, and with more than four years complaints. And then early, the unstimulated whole saliva was just about the level of the, the criteria for Schoenig syndrome. So that patient above and, and below. And the product gl uh, gland flow, you can see it here on the right side, was more on the, uh, was, was still pretty, uh, pretty much. But the submental and sublingual uh, glands were really reduced early and, and, and later on, this unstimulated and this is stimulated whole saliva. So what does it mean for the complaints? So early is mostly the dryness during the night and in the resting conditions. As, you saw, uh, as I showed you, then it's mostly the subminimal and sublingual glands active. And later, you can also complain uh, during eating because then there's a dryness, then the product uh, secretions are also really reduced, and then you have more problems with it. And then there's children with adults. When we look for children, the children mostly start with a recurrent swelling of the product glands. The swelling is much more uh, present in, the, in children. It's, it's also present in, in, in the, in, in the adult, uh, adults, but mostly in the adults, it's mostly the dry mouth and the dry eyes. So what are the signs of slip gland dysfunction? Of course, the oral dryness. There can be a swelling of the slip glands, thirst, but it's actually not really thirst. There's an increased need to moisten the oral cavity because there's still, there's still it's not the thirst which is central uh, mediated. And because of that frequent drinking during the, di the day, you can also have discomfort during the night, the nocturnal uh, uh, discomfort. Because you're awake, you have to go to the bathroom. It's nice to take a sip of water, but it's because you drink a lot during the day. And of course, you can also uh, get, when you're awake, you have a dry mouth. You get problems with your taste because the saliva is licking. You get eating problems, swallowing problems, and speech problems. A burning sensation in the mouth because you can get a yeast infection. You can change of the oral mucosa. And there's an increased risk of dental carriers. And this has just some, some signs where you can see the swollen slivery glands, the product glands. You can also have a swelling of the submineral glands on the ball. Yeah? And on the right side, you see a swollen parotid gland with a notice in it. In five to ten percent of the patients during the course of the, the, their disease, they may, may develop a lymphoma. And this mo mostly in the parotid glands. That's the, 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 the most frequent. They can have also chapped lips, uh, really, really dry lips. And angular gylitis, just a yeast infection in the in the in the, corn, in, 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 in the uh, corners of the mouth. 
and it's quite easy to treat. You have to have to you so some corticosteroids with with uh, uh, antifungal uh, past you can you can use. Mm -hmm. This is just the dry mouth, and this is just the, the, the tongue. And you can also experience, uh, imagine when you give a peppermint or something, and there's no water, you don't ex you don't, you don't taste it, and then you don't have a stimulating effect. This is this is a tongue with a cheek. It's a yeast infection. But it doesn't have to, 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 to be present with the white colonies. Quite often, there's just some reddish appearance of the, the gums or the tongue or other things. So that's, that's, that's a problem that the, the patients also quite, uh, we also quite frequently see. And this, this is the upper jaw, the cheek, and a part of the tongue. And this is a product gland, and you see the pus coming out of the product gland. And this is dental carriers. Because of the food, when you eat something, when I eat something, it is after part of uh, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, when it's sticking, it's, it's gone. But when you eat something and you doesn't you don't clean your mouth very well, it's it's, it's a present uh, half a day or one day. One day later, I still can see what you, uh, what your meal was when you doesn't uh, you clean it so well. And mostly it accumulates around the 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 the, 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 the in the cervical area of the teeth, so that's just above the the the, gin, the gums. And you can have uh, carriers in that specifically in that area, and when you can also have it much more expensive extensive as on the right side, then it is a dry mouth and uh, and, and you just don't take the good care of it, and it can go uh, pretty quick. Then we did uh, some experiments. Hmm? We have we had to use patients. With a dry mouth, we couldn't do it in a dentate patient, but we could take a denture. And then we built in this, so such so, 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 a container, and we put in some enamel slabs. And we put in the mouth, and the patient was not allowed to clean the mouth. And then we looked how what was the soft the surface became. Therefore, we used a diamond and we put the diamond with, with, uh, with a certain force on the surface. And the longer the indentation is, the softer is the enamel. We did it in irradiated, in, in radiated, uh, in irradiated subjects. And this was at the beginning, there's two weeks in the mouth, two, four weeks and six weeks in the mouth and up to 12 weeks. And what we could see in controls, we didn't see anything. And we had to prolong the experiment to see the first softening of the surface. While in a really dry mouth patient, and it can also be a Sjögren's patient, and the patient was not allowed to clean, then you saw already after two weeks, a pretty nice softening. And then after six weeks, we even lost the enamel. So in healthy subjects, nothing happened in six weeks. And in the really dry mouth patients, you lost the enamel. And we see it also in patients. And this is also could be the case in the really severe dry mouths of patients. And therefore, you can use a sodium fluoride or a rinse or a fluoride gel when the mouth is really dry. We can use, apply it with this type of containers, and we mostly apply it every second day. And the fluorides should be neutral because the gels which are mostly available are acidified. Because first the enamel should be a little bit dissolved, and then the fluoride is, is built into the enamel. But what you need, therefore, is saliva. And what you lack, in your mouth is saliva. 
therefore you shouldn't acidify it, but just use a neutral one. And when you use acidified, you mostly see damage instead that you really see a good protection of it. And gum of periodontal disease. Please. You can see slightly more inflammation of the gums, but there's no increased risk on periodontal disease. So there's increased risk on carriers, but no risk on on periodontal disease, not more than in healthy subjects. So this stage, even this stage of the gums, you mostly don't see it. It's very slight bleeding in your case you can see, but not really gum diseases. So when the diagnosis, just the complaints of the patient, you could do, you use, of course, the questionnaire, but also three questions I showed you before. How dry is your mouth? Do you need drinks with swelling, swelling of, uh, of salivary glands? That's a very good questions you can use. You could use the salivary squeezing. You could, could collect, just, just take uh, much time. You can do it just in, in resting and after some stimulation. And the glandular life that's just more, more for, for the clinic when you would really like it, uh, like to look to in, in, into, into it. You can use the slippery and ultrasound. Just a pepper of cell, cell image is a really certain disease and a normal is just a gray image. And of course, you can use a labial biopsy or product gland biopsy. In skilled hands, a labial biopsy is pretty good and uh, pretty well to do, to do, but a lot of patients experience numbness. And quite often these patients, uh, the, 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 the persons are, are not so skilled. I have seen biopsies with no glands in it, with all muscles and nerves. We do mostly a product biopsy, so it's just an alternative. In this area, it's just below uh, the, the earlobe, is pretty pretty safe to use, but then most of you use no, uh, need an oral surgeon, so it's not so a rheumatologist can't do it. But then the oral dryness, mm -hmm. you can of course you can use moistening of the uh, moistening of the mouth with water, and a lot of patients do it and like it. So there's, there's no problem. It's, it's a pressure feeling but it is not a good moistener for the for your oral services. And you all have experience, you take a sip of water and you have to repeat it pretty soon because the mouth is dry again. And also use some stimulation. You can, of course, chewing gum and mostly you have to, to, to need a, a specific preparation because the other is a little bit too irritating. Uh, there are some chewing gum specially developed for the, uh, for, for the dry mouth patients. You can use xylem melts, small tablets, which get stick to the gum and it can uh, dissolve a bit and you can get the simulation. You can use uh, dentate serous, this is malic acid in it, which is safe for the teeth and also Los, uh, uh, Salifa Ortana has some lozenges. This has just some examples what you could use. You could also use, of course, oh, there's not the dryness in the mouth. These are the tablets. You can see here that the dark layer, that's a layer which you can stick to, 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 to the mucosa or to the gum. And this is just the other. And then mostly patients without or with supplements that you could see experience also during the morning that your mouth is already a bit more moist. Of course, you can use paracarpine. I don't know if all, of all the people in, uh, for, from outside Europe are here present, because in, in, in Canada and the US, you can also cephaline, and that you can use, but, uh, but these uh, medicaments, they can have side effects like sweating, Tachycardia, so your heart is going a bit, bit quicker, and other things. Mm -hmm. 
And if that doesn't work, you can moisten the oil surfaces with oil rinses, like the gum uh, products, the, the, the Xeros products, the Bioextra, Sleeve Ortana, and all uh, other types of brands. It might, it might help you, not all patients like it. And that you, uh, if you don't like the one brand, it can, can be that the other brand helps you. So then you have to, you have, mostly you have to, to, to figure out which one really helps you. And during the night, then mostly at jail. Jail can also be used uh, in, in, during daytime, but then we quite often advise to use a jail. Like the hydrel, the uh, the biotin, the the dent aid, or other things. You can also use the xylemilt because yes, it's, it's, it's pretty safe when you put them just on the cheek. It stays there and uh, it dissolves very slowly, and then you can get some saliva. Mm -hmm. There are also some developments like the sali pen. I haven't used it. I, I know uh, that is there. That is a uh, kind of electrode you can put in your mouth. You uh, put it in your mouth just below uh, uh, the floor of the mouth in, in this area. You can activate it and it stimulates the glands. It's a direct stimulation. And then you can remove it and then uh, you, you may have for some time how long I don't expect, but you have to do it occasionally, a few times per day, you, you could apply it. Also, what is also is silo endoscopy, there's more rinsing the glands. This is on the lower, lower border is just a silogram. This is a gland, it's, it's a little bit inflamed, you can go here into the, the gland is here is the the, the the orifice of the duck and then you can put in corticosteroids but mostly it is a flushing of the gland and when you do it qu uh, quite often you see a better function of the gland what you could see here because this were just the the, the subjects with uh, which were more shem treated and this was subject with uh, the, the gland was flushed with saline or saline with corticosteroids. And then actually, a lot of those patients get a pretty normal sleeve secretion. So it might help. And it, it might be repeated. So it was here then up to one year. But some patients have a, a more a long lasting effect, and some patients it is lost again. Then the treatment with biologicals. There are a lot of drugs tested. I think some of you have well, uh, also participated in trials of these drugs. Most of the trials di didn't make a primary endpoint, so the effect could not really be shown. But when we look for the slippery flow, some of these biologicals might have a beneficial effect on saliva secretion and or the sensation of all dryness. So there's some hope. We don't use it for the treatment, but when you are treated with such a, such a drug, it might be a beneficial effect on your dry, on your dry uh, the sicker complaints, your dryness complaints. And then dental implants, are they possible? They are indeed possible. Because we did a study just from general practice, not, not in, a, in a research setting, then there were just four implants of the 174 uh, patient, uh, implants were lost. There was an implant survival after, uh, after, uh, after four years, median time, of 97%. That's almost equal as in healthy subjects. And then the gun bleeding, how the genitalia showed, the pocket probing death, so the, the, the probing there, they were mostly mostly on the shallow end. And just the, the bleeding was a little bit higher than the, than in the in the health subjects. And just the, the uh, very slight bleeding. And that is because there's a little bit 
plaque accumulation around the, the implants. And that can a li little bit be irritating, but then this was, uh, was cleaned again. So that uh, it was not the filling to, to a problem. So implants are pretty safe in the patients. So I talk about uh, the mouth, xerostomia, so a mouth, various taste disturbances, chewing, masticating, swallowing problems, appearance of disease, which is not there, implants you can use. But a lot of you will still experience a dry mouth. I mean, I hope we can do it and make it a much more pres uh, pre present. And this is the team I'm working with. So it's a huge team with rheumatologists, uh, all uh, materials, uh, surgeon expert, uh, experts, pathology experts, ophthalmology experts. And it was the end of my talk. Other questions? Thank you. Thank you, Professor Vincent. It was really, really interesting and passionate for us patient to understand a bit more how this is functioning. Mm -hmm. uh, we do have a lot of questions for you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, <clears throat> the first one is um, will be relative to uh, mouthwash and toothpaste. Yeah. So probably some patient asking, is there a role for toothpaste uh, in improving or reducing dryness? Not a toothpaste, not for in, in, in reducing all dryness. Of course, when you brush your teeth and there's a, a taste of it, it can stimulate a bit, but it is not really for, it's very good for saving your teeth and you have to brush a lot, but not really, to, it is not a treatment for all dryness. That's more a mouth rinse. Yes, so no precise recommendation on the, on the choice of the toothpaste. No, it, it should be a, a non-irritating toothpaste. Okay, okay, okay. And a lot of those toothpastes are a, a little bit irritating. And then it's mostly you have just to look what toothpaste you really like to use or not, which is not okay. irritating. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, there are brands for a dry mouth, which are, uh, are less irritating. And that you can use, but not to give a more moist mouth. Okay, and quite the same field. What do you think of mouth washes? Can they be dangerous for sugar and patients? No, the mouth washes are not dangerous. Of uh, you have to drink a lot of those mouth washes if if you get kind of like diarrhea or something, then you, you need to drink a whole bottle or two bottles. And I don't the, think that most are doing it. But this, 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 this are, are no side effects of uh, this, this, this. These are pretty safe. Okay, okay. Uh, another question related to, to the pain of... Um... How can the pain related to dryness and in the mouth in general um, can be best managed? I don't know what pain is meant. When there's pain from candida infection, for, for yeast infection, then of course the infection should be treated. When there's pain for the teeth, the teeth should be uh, treated. And when there's burning, there's mostly a yeast infection in, in these cases. So when, when that is uh, treated, the pain is mostly reduced. In case you can use, but it's more for a burning mouth. Yeah. Than, I for, see. Uh, yeah. Than, than for really sugar, then you can use a burning mouth uh, for, for, for the treatment. And of case you, you can use, uh, can use like something like uh, amitriptyline, you can use uh, clonazepam, and uh, what do you call it, uh, alpha lipoinus uh, acid, but that's uh, more the, 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 the treatments for a, dry, for a burning mouth and not for a specific sugar patient. Okay, okay. Uh, Vasco, do you have a. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, so we have a, a question, um, another question which is related uh, to these previous ones, uh, uh, which is if the typical dry mouth tongue cracks if, if they're reversible 
that's it's a, mostly what they uh, was taught it, it it could be a yeast infection so when you really treat the yeast and mostly the most of the quicks recovers but a, a, a normal tongue is also not completely smooth so a, a small quicks that will also be there but it can be reduced with with, uh, with an, an antifungal treatment. So do you, do you suggest that when we see and when we in clinic see a lot of uh, patients with these uh, cracks and very dry mouth, uh, that there might be a fungal component there as well? And if yeah. you treat that, improves? It might. It might be when there are complaints, of course, you, because okay. a yeast is also a normal organism in the mouth. About uh, one in three healthy subjects already have a yeast in the mouth mm. and they also protect your mouth from becoming inflamed but when this is uh, when the uh, the, the uh, how you call it the uh, the balance between the microns is a little bit disturbed then the yeast can become a problem uh, we see it all uh, quite often after the use of antibiotics that you can, can uh, a yeast infect or corticosteroids you can also get a yeast infection mm -hmm. And then it's um, better to tweet. Okay, and I think that was that was clear. Um, and then a question: If uh, are mucolytics effective in your opinion? I don't work so much with mu mucolytics. It's uh, when it's a really sticky saliva in certain uh, certain mouths. Not a, it could help, but I don't have a really experience with it. And uh, I don't have uh, very often questions for a shakers patient that, uh, that that's a problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I know the feeling. <laughs> um, another question, Professor Vissink. Uh, what about nutrition? What do you think about nutrition? Is there a role for improving oral issues? Uh, when they are well uh, nourished, it is very important to, of course. <laughs> and they have just to, they do, you shouldn't use all things, what a lot of people with a really dry mouth, then the more sweet or more, 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 more soft or other things. And that, that are more the keratogenic uh, agents and food that shouldn't be, shouldn't be used. And just the normal things should be used. And then it's, uh, when there's a problem to, to finding something, then it's very good to, to ask a dietitian to, to advise you what foods you could use. Okay, because, you know, patients are often fear of choking because not really lack of saliva, but yeah. sticky saliva. Yeah. And uh, we, we have some patients who, who fear to eat s s some food because mm. of the risk of choking. Mm. So uh, it's, uh, it's you important. Get an awesome advice to the, or the, 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 the attention. It's a, it's a good, uh, it's a good yeah. advice. Yeah, we, yeah. we should um, uh, advise more patients to, to make uh, <clears throat> a dietitian consultation to help. Yeah. Okay, I guess, uh, I don't know, Vasco, uh, on my side. Uh, yes, no more I, have a, I have a question. So we, I, I don't think we have uh, more questions from the audience. Um, there's still time. Um, I have a question which is, um, in the meantime, uh, which is related to one of the things that you said, which is uh, the quantity and some patients, uh, this discrepancy between some patients having normal salivary flow, but then mm -hmm. they have dry mouth, other patients uh, have abnormal, but they don't complain of, of, of dry mouth. And, and also you showed a slide where you could see that in patients with early Sjogren's already from uh, uh, in the first year, they had already uh, near the cut, the, the average at least was near the cut of, of 0 0.1. Mm -hmm. So how, how do you see this? Because this is very often, in, this happens at least in our, in our experience, very often in clinical practice patients, complaining of dry mouth, um, uh, I see two groups. So one group is sugar patients that are younger and that uh, still have some uh, normal, at least unstimulated salivary flow. Mm -hmm. And then patients that are older that do not have uh, sugars, but they also have very reduced um, 
how do you interpret this and, and how also can we explain patients uh, these, these, these nuances? It's not black and white. Mm -hmm. First is a, a patient experience a dry mouth in most of the cases when their, their flow is about half what was normal for the patient. Mm -hmm. A patient with has a, a really health, uh, a really high flow experience when it's, it's half already a dry mouth with a lot of saliva. And on the contrary, there's also the patients who have almost no saliva in the mouth from the beginning are in. That should also be half before they really get the dry mouth. It's just the, the, the general thing. Then there are, of course, a lot of other uh, causes of dry mouth. You, you call them uh, were non shogun patients. Mm -hmm. And that's mostly the, 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 the drugs they are used. When they, they use too, too much drugs, of, mm -hmm. of uh, particular, uh, particular drugs, then they get, can, can get a dry mouth. And then it's, yeah, the, the rest things, mostly they have a pretty normal uh, stimulated secretion or a little bit reduced, mm -hmm. but the unstimulated is really low. And then you, 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 you should pass the, put them on uh, some kind of stimulation that they experience a less dry mouth. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. I think this yeah. was very, very, uh, interesting, uh, both for this was intended mostly for patients and, and families of patients, but also uh, for clinicians. I think this was very, very interesting. And so, thank you again, Professor Vissink, for this uh, lecture. Um, as uh, we mentioned, uh, this will be available on YouTube for everyone to later see. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, you can catch us also uh, next week at the same time. Uh, or close to the same time uh, for Sjogren's Essentials, also aimed at Sjogren mm -hmm. patients, relatives, and everyone interested in these disease. Thank you all for joining and uh, good afternoon. Yeah. Thank you everyone, bye-bye. Thank Bye -bye. you.